We celebrate um, not just during the Christmas and Thanksgiving season, but all throughout the year. And I want you all, I want us all to be reminded of God's goodness to us and how much his names mean. Because um, the passage is writ, uh, read in Isaiah chapter 9, talking about the various names of Christ. And this was indeed the long-expected Savior coming to the earth, where angels wondered about the timing. Prophets proclaimed who was going to come. And this was God made flesh. The Word become flesh dwelling among us, and that we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. And so it's great to be together as family. Love the decorations. Thank you for those who have decorated this uh, sanctuary. And this is not fake fruit up here. This is real. It is like a picture. And there's a celebration at the one o'clock service today. I'm celebrating uh, Thanksgiving and the Christmas season. And we have a lot to be grateful for as people, amen? Right? We have abundance, we have joy, we have hope and assurance, we have all the good things we need for life and godliness in Jesus Christ, and it's good to celebrate together. So thank you, choir, for singing for us, and thank you, worship team, for leading us. And we're going to dismiss the kids, actually, right now as well. So kids are anticipating going down to Children's Church. Well, did you have a good Thanksgiving? Was it okay? Hopefully it was good. Hopefully you enjoyed some time with family and friends, and hopefully um, some prayer around the tables. And it can be lonely for some as well, remembering and thankful for who are there, but also uh, missing those who are not there. And so we uh, continue to move forward in what God has given to us and the gifts he's given us. And one of those gifts we have is Pastor Gordon Hanstead. So, Pastor Gordon, if you would come on up. He is bringing the word for us this morning. And uh, I have appreciated this man dearly, getting to know him over the last year and a half, two years. Appreciate his wisdom. Appreciate his heart for God and for this congregation. Appreciate his prayers that take place and his example um, for so many of us. And I'm so delighted that he said yes to speak this morning because I surely have appreciated his messages to us. And he has earned the right to sit when he speaks. <laughs> and I'm grateful that you are here among us. And I'll get your water as well and put it over here, Gordon. So thank you for uh, bringing the word to us today. So why don't we all welcome Gordon Hanstead. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to Pastor Dave for him giving me the opportunity to share the word with you. When he asked me to speak on this Sunday, which is the first Sunday of Advent, now, Advent is the beginning of expecting the appearance of Christ to come. Four weeks before Christmas, Advent begins. It dates back to the 7th century when it was first observed, and it has been observed ever since. I sit before you this morning, and I, I recognize, and I hope you recognize, that at my age, I may make mistakes. Of course, I've done all of that throughout life. But as I shared with, are we coming over too loud? Okay. I told Pastor Dave this morning, there has never been in recent years such excitement in my own heart as I prepared a message to bring to you people on this Sunday morning. I have not only constructed a sermon, but I've been living it every single day, thinking about the truth of the Word of God. And we have to go back to the very beginning. And with your Bibles open to John chapter 1. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Now you notice, in the beginning was the word. What was the word? It says he, he was God. This introduces us to Jesus Christ before he was born. He was from the beginning. And being in the beginning, he manifested himself to the world. Now look farther in John chapter 1. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of of grace and truth. He became flesh. And when he became flesh, we saw his glory. What a tremendous statement. And this glory, John says, was full of grace and truth. And that immediately points us to the salvation that is ours in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, way back in Exodus chapter 34, we have the story of Moses being called of God to do something that Moses thought thought was absolutely impossible for him to do. But God says, I'll be with you. And there was kind of a a debate between God and and Moses. And Moses finally came to realize that maybe God was really absolutely convinced that he, Moses, could do what he had commanded, what God had commanded him to do. And then we read in the 34th chapter that Moses said, Lord, I I do believe what you said, but I want you to show me your glory. Show me your glory. And then it's very interesting to find out how God deals with Moses. He said, do you want to see my glory? And the Lord said to him, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. You want to see my glory? My glory is my love and my compassion for you. Then in the 34th chapter of of Exodus, the Lord calls Moses up into the mountain. And he said, I want you to come with two tablets of stone, like the first one. I want you to come up here. I don't want anyone to come with you. I don't want any of the cattle or the beasts of the field to be there. I want a solitary meeting with you and with you alone. And then it says this, and the Lord to him. You want to see my glory? Listen to this. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, soul to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. He does not have the guilty. He does not Leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children. You want to see my glory? My glory is my compassion and my graciousness. 
I'm patient with people. That's my glory. Then you, then you will recall in the sixth chapter of the book of, of Isaiah, the, uh, in the day, day that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I saw him. And as a result of seeing him in his glory, Isaiah goes on and says, above him there were, were the seraphs, and they were calling one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The only place in scripture where one of the attributes of God is mentioned three times. Holy, holy, holy. Never forget that the glory of God is centered in the fact of his holiness. I turn to the first chapter of the book of Revelation and John the Apostle vanished to the island of Patmos. He sees the Lord. He sees the Lord, and he writes this way, I was in the Spirit, in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice of a trumpet. I turned to see, and I saw seven lampstands, someone like the Son of Man. I saw the Lord in control, his glory. How important it is for us to somehow wrap our hearts around the fact of the glory of God. And we saw his glory, the glory of the only Father. He has become that I may became. He became. He appeared. His glory appeared that I might understand that I have a relationship with a holy, holy, holy God. We, we go on to the second, the very next thing. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Mark this in your Bible. Now you, you will notice you were handed out an outline. Ever since I graduated from seminary and had classes in preaching, we were taught to outline. And I've never been a manuscript preacher. I've always used outline. Okay, he, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, he became the source of eternal salvation. He became the source of eternal salvation that I may eventually become one of his children. In other words, the writer of Hebrews is saying, that Jesus Christ was the cause of salvation. The King James Version has this, that he was the author of salvation. The matter of fact is that he is the one who brings salvation to life. He is the causer of salvation. He is the one that causes something to happen. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. All rights. He came into the world to save sinners. One day, Jesus Christ 
was in his hometown. He, it was on the Sabbath day, and he went into the synagogue. And he was handed the roll of the scriptures. And he opened it, and he read this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoner, sight to the blind, released from the oppressed. He came into this world to preach the gospel of salvation. And because he came, I, one day, back in 1946, on May the 7th, 1946, I came into a relationship with Christ. I was born again into the family of God because Christ is the source of salvation. Let's go to another one. 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter and verse 9. Going, going back just to the previous statement that I made, uh, Jesus one day was walking down the street, and there was a small fellow by the name of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus climbed up in the tree. He wanted to see Jesus as he passed by. He came down. Jesus said, I'd like to come to your house. And there was one statement. Today, salvation has come to your house. Okay, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. He was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty, may become rich. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says this, In him we have been enriched in every way. As a result of that salvation that became mine, as a result of that salvation that has become you, yours, you have become rich. Rich in what? Rich in his grace, rich in his love, rich in his security, rich in all things. Not the material with that riches, the spiritual riches. Going through my mind over the last several weeks has been an old song. How it ever came back to my mind, I cannot understand. That's, that was some of the reason for the, the hymn. You can perhaps remember more hymns than you can verses in the Bible. But this song goes through my mind. What though wars may come, with marching feet and the beat of the drum, for I have Christ in my heart. I have Christ in my heart. Though he was rich, yet he became poor, that you and I, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, that just stop and think a little bit about Christmas. We, we know that poem, "'Twas the Night Before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouth." Take your eyes off the world. Put your eyes on eternity. What do we see in eternity? "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the heavens. What was happening? 
They were getting ready for Christ to come. I imagine the angel choir was rehearsing. They perhaps had to rehearse just like us. They were, the seraphims were wondering and learning what they should say. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will to men. All of this was hard. And God the Father and God the Holy Spirit were bidding farewell to God the Son. For he was to leave his heavenly mansion. And he was going as to go to earth. And so they were saying goodbye. The rich became poor. Everything that Christ enjoyed in heaven, the fellowship with the Trinity, the praise and the glory, the magnificence, a man in glory. Through a miracle we cannot understand, that man was sent to earth and found his embryo in the womb of a young child. He rich, he left the riches of glory to come to us. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Here we have the summation of the message of Christmas. It's necessary for me to read the whole thing. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 5. Who being in the nature, in being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. He became obedient to death. The summation of the Christmas story. Notice first of all, the exaltation that he enjoyed. He was being found in the form of God. Think of the re- reputation he renounced. He emptied himself. Think of, think of the identification he accepted. He took upon himself the form of of a servant, the form of a servant, bond servant, a bond servant who could own nothing, who did not have his own will, no rights of his own. He is owned by somebody else. The humiliation he endured, he became obedient unto death even the death on the cross. That's the Christmas story. He became obedient to death that I might experience the eternal giving of life. And then the next verse after that statement Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Because he went to the cross. And when I think of the cross, buried, shame, and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And what does the Bible tell us this? That when it comes to the end, when history has run its course, when Christ has come back again and we are brought into the presence of the Lord, what does he say about those of us who are Christians? Come into your eternal heaven. What does he say to the non-Christians, to those who did not respond? What did he say? He said, you one day are going to bow your knee in the presence of God and you're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it's too late. It's too late. So that's the Christmas story. He became this, that I might become that. And that is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Going back to seminary days, before we graduated from seminary, we had to have so many credits in Old Testament, New Testament, church management, and all. And I can remember the old pastor, Adolf Old who every now and then substituted in our preaching class. And this elderly gentleman, he wasn't as old as I am now, but he was in his late 80s, still teaching at the seminary. He said to our class of six or seven young future pastors, he said, when you stand up behind the pulpit, he did, never did say anything about sitting when you preach, but if, as you stand before your people, remember this, that there are four types of people in that congregation. Number one, there are people who are there because they have been invited by someone, but they have no interest at all in what's going on. Completely disinterested. Then you have some people Lord deliver me from 93 uh, then there are some people in the congregation that are there and they are listening and they have a little concern about spiritual matters the third group of people are Christ people who think they are Christians, but they don't have real assurance of that fact. And the fourth, there are people who love the Lord and are living for him day and night. I look out of the audience. I don't know everyone. I know most of you. I'm getting acquainted with some of the people from uh, the church the pastor used to pastor. I don't know where you stand, but you're in one of those four groups. At this Christmas season, when we honor the Lord Jesus Christ, when his name appears more than ever before, my heart goes out to those people who have never made a commitment of their life to the Lord. I'm asking you this morning. Do you know Christ as your Savior and as your Lord? Has there been a time in your life's experience that you have 
come before him and pray to oh the Lord, I need you. If you haven't, I would say, do it today. I ask you to bow your head as we pray. Father in heaven, your plan is so perfect. Your plan is so great and so powerful. And the gospel of God has at all times melted our hearts and has brought us to the realization that without Christ we are lost. Thank you for the salvation that you want. When you left your heavenly throne, came back to earth to establish salvation for us. I pray, Father, for each person here this morning, that if they know not Christ as their Savior, Maybe come to realize who he is, what he is, why he has come, and why they need to be found. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, Gordon. That was good, wasn't it? Thank you. Okay, we're going to.